Every now and then, I meet someone who's changing the world for the better by their sheer will alone. Whether they're authors, activists, or adventurous, these people are blazing a path with their deep enthusiasm and allowing the world to follow. Their passion is strong, and my passion is to tell their stories. I am Brian Platt, and this is Passion Project. This week, I sit down with Dr. Paul O'Donoghue, a wildlife biologist and the chief scientific advisor of the Scottish Wildcat Haven. The Scottish Wildcat is the most endangered mammal in Britain and one of the rarest animals in the world. These wildcats, which used to inhabit all of Great Britain, can now only be found in the Scottish Highlands, and they're facing genetic extinction largely due to inbreeding with domestic cats. So, thanks for joining me, Paul. You're very welcome. Thanks, Brian. Nice to be here. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a great organization, but they're relatively unknown species, at least to um, most people. What got you involved in the Scottish Wildcats to begin with? Well, I, I'm a wildlife biologist. I've been lucky enough to work in animals all over the world, um, but I'm from the UK. And, and about eight years ago, people started to ask me, um, could I help with the Scottish Wildcat? And I'll be honest, at that stage, I didn't know much about it. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized the desperate plight of this animal and also, you know, just how incredibly beautiful it is and how important it is to Scottish ecosystems and also to Scottish culture. So I felt I had to do something and and we took it from there, really. But, yeah, it was I, I myself wasn't fully aware of the plight until I started to delve into this um, subject area and really get a handle on on the status of this animal. And And the more I looked into it, the more concerned I grew. And, and once I realized that this is now, you know, the rarest cat in the world, you simply, I can't walk away from that. You've got to do something. And so people often confuse these wild cats with domestic cats, right? Uh, I've seen a few, um, you know, interviews and, and videos where people have a hard time discerning the difference, but they most certainly are not domestic cats. Can you talk a little uh, bit about how different they are from how they look and how they act? I uh, hear they have a special quality that they really don't like humans which is pretty uh must make them tough to track and, and analyze yeah so so the scottish wildcat um and all wildcats are actually the ancestors of domestic cats so of oh. course there's a similarity so every single domestic cat on the planet so people sat at home with their pet cats that they love those cats descended from wildcats but the key is when you when you see a, a true wildcat the wild version um, a pure wild cat, it's incredibly different from a domestic cat. To give you an idea, the biggest Scottish wild cat we've ever seen was four feet long. No, oh, wow. That's pretty huge. <laughs> you, you certainly wouldn't want that sat on your lap. <laughs> uh, and the, mar the, the markings are very different. They have like tiger stripes on them. They have a thick ringed tail, which is blunt at the end. They have a very clear dorsal stripe. And the, the fur is completely different to a domestic cat. It's it's thick, it's, it's got different layers to it rather than the smooth, sleek coat of a domestic cat. And also behaviorally, they're, in, they're, they're totally different, to be honest. So they're reputed to be untamable. Now, wow. I've worked with lions and tigers before, and they steady down um, in captivity pretty quickly. However, a wild cat, and I can speak from experience, we rescued some kittens, and they have not tamed down one bit <laughs> since the moment we got there was wilder now than when when we first rescued them so yeah this, this this kind of ferocious nature which is kind of mythical for the scottish wildcat is actually true so how long have you been with the wildcat haven and what is your responsibilities as its chief scientific advisor so i uh, wildcat haven's been going now for about seven years um and and i basically oversee the operational side of things so we coordinate i coordinate all the survey work all the monitoring, but also real practical hands-on conservation. So we, we go to remote communities and we offer a free neutering service for pet cats, for example. So we neuter people's pet cats, we microchip them free, we do disease screening. This is all about reducing the number of domestic cats in the wild environment. And if we do that, that's how we save the wild cat. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm sometimes doing kind of hardcore science and, and other times I'm out in my in a four by four <laughs> picking up cats from remote areas and taking them to a vet clinic so <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit of everything which I which I love um, and I love being out in the wild beautiful Scottish Highlands so yeah it's um 
it's it's good fun. It's good fun. Yeah, and your wife, you actually work with your wife, Emily O'Donoghue. Uh, she's yeah. the director of the Wildcat Haven. Um, yeah. So it's a bit of a family affair. How do you guys, in what capacity do you two uh, work together? Yeah, so it's it's, it's re- it works really well. So yeah, my wife Emily, she she she's a uh, more organised than me, should I say? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and she, Emily does the administrative side of the the organisation, and I do the operations. And obviously, as you'd imagine, those two um, areas interlink. So you know, working with your wife is it's actually really efficient, and we get things done quickly. We know how each other works, and it, and it works really well. It's nice to, and obviously, we can discuss ideas and and run ideas past each other honestly. Um, and that, that's that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you can, you know, you guys are very sympathetic in the in the fact that, in the way you work together. So, um, yeah. So what is the uh, so the biggest threat to the Scottish wildcat is actually hybridization with domestic cats, as we touched upon a little bit earlier. Um, I I think this genetic extinction is a very interesting way for a species to go. Like, do you know of any other animal, any other species that is facing extinction? Uh, in this way of just being genetically hybridized with another animal. Well, you are, you're absolutely right, Brian. You know, it is it is kind of a novel way to go extinct, um, sadly. I mean, there is hybridization with other species. So, for example, I, I know in the US and in Europe, um, wolves are now starting to hybridize with domestic dogs. So it's a similar um, issue. But, but it, I don't know of any other species where its actual entire existence is about to be jeopardized by hybridization so that's why the scotch wildcat is unique and it, and it's because the wildcat is the ancestor of domestic cats that it can interbreed with them and produce fertile hybrids so it's, it's basically a genetic swamping hmm. and it's kind it's kind of an extinction vortex <clears throat> and, and the only way to combat that is to neuter um non wildcats non so if you get like a cat in the environment that's not a wildcat you need to neuter that cat so it can't interbreed with the pure wildcats. Right, and I heard you say in an interview, and it makes sense. I mean, there's only 35 of these left in the west, and about 13 left in the east of Scotland. And you said just by numbers, they're way more um, likely to encounter a feral or domestic cat than they are one of their own. So this inbreeding is, is you know, a big thing that that could really happen, and does happen every day. Yeah. Yeah, it's far more likely in most places for a Scottish wildcat to come across a domestic cat than another wildcat. So, you know, if it takes that mating opportunity, which it will, then you get mm-hmm. this, this hybrid swarm, this um, extinction vortex. So, you know, the only way... So you have to be bold and brave and deal with this issue. Yeah. Um, and you have to be ambitious. This has to be over a large scale. So we work over, you know, thousands of square miles um, doing this kind of neutering work, um, wow. reducing the risk of hybridization. Wow. So how did this happen? How did these wildcats, I mean, they are embedded in Scottish culture. You said they are, you know, incredibly fierce. I mean, even, you know, less able to be tamed than actual, than lions and tigers. Um, They've appeared on clan emblems for, you know, Scottish clans. How did they go from that being renowned to being virtually extinct uh, or, or very critically endangered? Yeah, I think, I think there's a number of factors. I think one is um, they're very difficult to monitor. I mean, they're super elusive. Mm. Even if you're like monitor, monitoring them remotely with camera traps, they're so hard to get on camera. So just actually getting a handle on actual figures is difficult. So maybe there's been a little bit of complacency. Maybe people have kind of assumed there's more than they are. Yeah. Maybe, maybe people think, well, oh, you know, well, it's rare anyway. It's elusive. So just because we're not seeing a lot of them doesn't mean there's a lot in the environment. So I think there's an element of that. And I think there's also now an increased understanding of hybridization. So, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, people assumed that if it was a tabby looking cat in the environment, then it was a wildcat. But now, as we know, as we now define, able to define what a wildcat is, and we've got these remote cameras that can give us good images of cats in the wild, we're realizing that actually the real deal, the pure Scottish wildcat, is now you know seventy times rarer than a giant panda, oh, wow. and it's and it, and it's caught a lot of people out, and it's caught the government out to be honest. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, it's a combination of factors of of difficulty in monitoring and a lack of understanding of of the extinction process for this animal. 
I mean, do we have an accurate understanding of, of how many there once were or, or when this decline, uh, this sharp decline happened? I, I mean, you know, um, thousand, you know, maybe 10,000 years ago, there would have been, there would, wildcats would have been found all over the UK. You oh, know, wow. they were all, they were, they were found from, from John O'Groats in the north of Scotland to, to Land's End down in, down in Cornwall. We've, and we've found bone evidence of wildcats all throughout the UK. Oh, wow. Some of these, you know, it's really exciting, actually. We have some really good people who are, they're braver than me. They go down to, like, they go down limestone caves and oh. explore and, and bring out the, um, the ancient remains of different animals and we find we find wildcat in there along along with with brown bear and wolf and lynx but we also get wildcat so wild, the wildcats were found all over the uk and and they're only confined now to the scottish highlands because you know it makes sense really that's where the least people are that's where the least number of domestic cats are mm-hmm. and that's where the most habitat is so it kind of makes perfect sense really because of this hybridization where you get less people, you get more wildcats. Yeah, it makes complete sense, especially if they're so elusive um, yeah. as they are. So how how is the population trending? Like once we've gotten a pulse on how many there are, and I know it's very difficult to determine, but how have you been able to see some efforts um, paying off in, in, in the long run? Yeah, so so our, our, our concept is to um, create areas in the wild, where wildcats can only breed with other wildcats. So our first field site is on the Arden American Peninsula. It's a very wild place. It's the westernmost point of the British Isles. It's, it's a beautiful place, very remote. So we, it's, it's a mainland island, effectively. It's a peninsula. So what we had this idea was to um, neuter everything, every cat in that area that wasn't a wildcat. Now, this area is like a thousand square miles, and people thought we were crazy. But by with a dedicated team of people and with enormous community support and engagement, we've actually managed to do it. Wow. So now we don't find any unneutered domestic cats in this area. And we're starting to see more and more wildcat kittens. <sighs> so that's incredibly exciting. You know, when you see like uh, one of my favorite pictures is of a, a wildcat kitten that. He was moving so fast past the camera. It was like a blur, but you can just see all the stripes and the beautiful <laughs> um, ring tail on this tiny little um, wildcat. It's a miniature wildcat, you know, and that, that's what keeps you going. That's what gets you out of bed in the morning to go and do the work you need to do. So, yeah, it's, it definitely works, but it's it's hard work. And it, and you need and it, you need to be big scale and, and ambitious to get this done. Sure. Was there a point that you started finding things taking momentum? Like with a lot of these, you know, even for yourself, awareness is a big thing. So we mentioned that, you know, initially you weren't very aware of the species, much like a lot of people. And then once you found out about their plight, um, you know, you wanted to help out. Did you find that with the people that you're trying to reach as well, that once they find out, once you get awareness out there, that people are more apt to, um, to help, hundred percent. So, like, we we go in the communities, and and so even though the wildcats there are wildcats there, some people aren't even aware of their existence, or they've right, never yeah. seen one. So, it's an education process on both a, on both a, a local, a national, and international scale. But but what what really heartens me now is, let's say someone new moves to our study site area. One of the first things people ever we we normally get calls calls from them very early on, because they say to us, oh. Everyone's told us to neuter our cat or to make sure it's 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 vaccinated. Oh, wow. So it's like so it's like there's almost like community policing, um, in a, in a, in the nicest possible way. Of course, yeah. Where the, where the communities are kind of self policing now, and they want to protect the valuable wildcats, and they and they they kind of educate each other and this kind of this network of people, and that's that's hugely encouraging, and that's what gives us hope that the because effectively with all wildlife, it's the local communities that must become custodians of their own their own animals yeah. and, and we're seeing that really clearly in in, in the areas that Wildcat Haven's working in and that that's that's you know the best thing that can happen yep I've done in the past few podcasts I've done uh, they've been about um, you know either shrinking ecosystems or um, you know, population loss of a specific species and it's come up time and time again that as important as it is to track and analyze the animals, it's just as important, if not more so, to educate the public about 
this incredible gift they have in the area. Um, Because that's ultimately those people are the ones that will can either make or break your efforts. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And it's the same with with most animals, to be honest. You know, Mm -hmm. animals and people, we're the the same. We don't live in isolation from each other. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's about connecting people with nature, connecting people with wild places and inspiring people. And once they realize that they're living in an area with the various cat on the planet, well, they they get pretty excited about that. (laughs) Yeah. And and, and that's a pretty cool thing to have on your doorstep. And, um, you know, it, it enhances their own environment and it makes their own environment more exciting. And that's a that's a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned that in some interviews, you know, when we talked about this earlier, that they are, uh, you know, we love them, but they hate us. And they are truly <laughs> wildcats. So that probably makes it incredibly difficult to track, analyze, and, um, you know, keep a good number of them. Do you have any times where that was an issue? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, these that, that that interview, I, mean, I know which interview you're talking about when I was talking about these kittens. So, you know, we rescued these, like, beautiful, stunning kittens. And, you know, they 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 hate us. They hate us. They, they ne- they've never warmed to us because they're just so wild. They they don't lose that um, that fear of people. And that that's fantastic, actually, because we want these kittens, any kittens that we rescue, we're not a zoo. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not a captive facility. Our job is to get these animals back into the wild. And the wilder those kittens are, the better chance they have of survival. So it's that instinct in them that will give them the the chance of success in the future. So, yeah, but obviously we, we love them. We, we, we dote on them. We, <laughs> but, we, but we never see them in, in real. Once we put them in the, enclo- in the rehabilitation enclosure, we never actually see them. Mm-hmm. And one, apart from on remote cameras. You know, we've got one guy there. He's been the keeper for six months. He's never actually seen one in the flesh. Oh, wow. So that just shows how wild these things are. Um, and, and, you know, and, and when, we, when we catch them very rarely to, to do a health check and to vaccinate them, they, they're like balls of fury. I mean, they, they really are. <laughs> and we do everything. And, you know, I, I'm a... I, I, animal welfare is a massive priority for me so we do everything quickly and efficiently and as stress free as possible mm-hmm. but these, these things you know they they look at you as though they want to they want to <laughs> attack you and uh, you know and, and but that that's a good thing because that will allow them to survive in the in the harsh Scottish Highlands yeah. as they come home so Absolutely. yeah so it's 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 in the benefit that the wild it's, it's, it's we want to keep them wild but when it comes to like the wild wildcats, the ones that are out in the forest, they're incredibly elusive. I often joke with people. I say, "We're probably being watched by a wildcat now, but we'll never see it." Mm-hmm. You know, we can stand in <laughs> we can stand in areas where we know there's wildcats, but you just don't see them. Right. Um, <laughs> but I think that's kind of neat to think of a wildcat on a on a craggy, rocky outcrop, looking down the mount, looking down the glen, and there's humans wandering around and. You know, it's it sees us, but we don't see it, and I think that's that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, it's very cool. It's you know, it's on their terms exclusively. Yeah, exactly, exactly, always. So, speaking of interviews, one another one I heard was just up until recently, like the you guys thought that wildcats were only existed in the west coast of Scotland, um, but then I think it was a few months ago you actually found this whole population of thirteen wildcats in the east. Scotland as well, which is like roughly a third of the population of what you thought there was. Um, how excited were you when you discovered this? I mean, this must have been incredible. And then are there any thoughts of introducing the two populations to each other or um, kind of making a, a larger group between the two of them? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, we, we were focusing on the West Coast because the West Coast is a lot wilder. Mm. Um, in the East Highlands, but there was this guy who kept emailing me saying he knew where Wildcat was, and I was like, okay. I sent him a camera. I sent him a camera trap, and I, I thought I'd get like someone's pet cat on it or something like that. And he sent me one of the best Wildcats I'd ever seen. Oh wow! Um, so, so we then started to build a project around it. We and we started to find more and more Wildcats. So he's a guy called um, Kevin Bell. Um, he's a I call him the Wildcat Whisperer <laughs> because he's found. He's found more wildcats than anybody else in the world, me, me, me included. 
I, I found ten, he's found thirteen, so he's beating me. Oh wow! Um, but but he's he's um, he's fantastic at doing it, and we found his population of thirteen wildcats in the Clash and Derrick Forest. But when you see the Clash and Derrick Forest, you understand why they're there. It's it's huge, it's vast, it's remote. There's no there's not many farms in the area. There's not many domestic cats in the area. There's mm. no major roads going through it. So it makes perfect sense again. So yeah, now this Clash and Derrick population has become vital to the future survival of the Scottish wildcat as a species. And you're absolutely right. At some point, we will look to mix the east and west populations. Obviously, in the past, there would have been continuous forest all the way through. Right. Um, now that habitat's become fragmented, so we'll have to, at some point, um, translocate animals in a sensitive uh, way, and managed way. And that will allow genetic vigor to build in the last in the two last wildcat populations. But yeah, it's very exciting, and it's um, the East Highlands wildcats offer fresh hope for the for the species. Wow! Yeah, I mean that must have been incredible, especially you know not really truly believing that the guy had seen them anyways. Um, yeah, I mean we, we we get so many people like emailing us in saying they've seen a wildcat, and we take every every potential sighting seriously, but most of them mm-hmm. turn out to be like uh, a pet cat or a hybrid. But, you know, when this guy started turning up, like he found the beast, you know, that video I sent yep. of, a four, of a four foot wildcat. Wow. He found it. He found that animal. Yeah, that is, I, I will post that video because that is uh, it's awesome. truly incredible. Yeah, he's a beautiful <laughs> animal, incredible animal. So is that the end goal? Like is the end goal to, uh, I mean, your group is called Wildcat Haven. Is that the end goal to have a, an area that they couldn't even you know, come in contact with any domestic or feral cats at all? Yeah, so so the idea is our our major aim is to create a 7,000 square mile wildcat haven area in the West mm-hmm. Highlands. So this is an area, uh, we've already got about 1,500 square miles that we've, cl- we've cleared of um, intact domestic cats. So we want to expand that up the West Highlands to create this 7,000 square mile area where wildcats can only breed with other wildcats. And we want to aim for a population of between 250 and 500 wildcats in this in this haven area, oh, which wow. will save which will save the animal from extinction. So again, it's ambitious. It's it's large scale, but we've got to think like that. This is how we've got to think. Mm-hmm. So this animal doesn't go extinct um, on our watch. Yeah, absolutely. What is the uh, the low number like that? What is the number that at that point you can say with that, with confidence? that they would probably not go extinct. Like right now, they will become extinct without human intervention, from my understanding. So where yeah. is that that threshold? I think once you start to get to 250 animals, okay. then you can start to take a bit of a breather. You don't want to relax too much because like a, a disease outbreak or you know habitat disturbance or something like that, a major development could still push them over the edge. But once you get to 250, you can start to think about population management. Gotcha. Um, and then you want to get to the next milestone, which is 500. You know, and and we we don't want to stop there. Mm-hmm. There, there should be there should be thousands of wildcats across Scotland. Scotland's a, you know, compared to the US, it's tiny, but it's got enough habitat to support thousands of wildcats, and that yeah. needs to be our goal. You know, this is a we have we have five year aims, but we have also have 10 year, 20 year, and 50 year goals that we want to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. I, I... I can definitely understand that. You never really want to give up. Um, no. You know, it's a lot of hard work going into it. Yeah, so, this, this, this is a lifetime project, for, but not just me, but for everyone involved in the project and, and for people who take over from us when, when we're long gone. That's really interesting because you actually have done a lot of work with different animals. What sets the wildcats apart, the Scottish wildcats? Because you work with black rhinos in South Africa. You're working to reintroduce the Barbary lion, which is now extinct in the wild, but you're trying to reintroduce it into Morocco, or there's an effort to reintroduce it into Morocco. Um, what sets these wildcats apart that you know you will be working with them forever? For, for me, it's, it's a few things. It's just um, it's just finding out just how, how endangered they were. They are. I mean, it's, it's the last stand for the wildcat. You just mm-hmm. can't walk away from that. But also just just seeing how beautiful they are you know they're incredibly graceful they're incredibly beautiful when you see one i've only seen like four wildcats in the wild in my life wow but when when you see one move god it's it's amazing um they're like miniature tigers 
and and <laughs> wow. they just they've just got that swagger and and um, yeah, I, I love the fact that they're so elusive, and I love the fact that they're real survivors, and I also like the fact that they're they're kind of untamable. They haven't lost that um, yeah that wild spirit, and that they're in, they're indomitable, and I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, I I like that as well. So, is there anything that you've been able to um, learn from your working with other organizations and other animals? Um, like, is there anything that you've been able to learn that you can apply to these wildcats? Definitely, the the, the, the key thing is community engagement, and community buy-in. You know, I've done a lot of work in Africa where you have to have real grassroots support, but it's the same in the UK. You need grassroots support to build these projects. So that's a really strong message that I've, I've taken from that. But also, I've been involved in a lot of um, population management projects where you have to actively manage critically endangered species. And I've done that with birds and mammals. I've worked with some of the most endangered animals in the world. Um, and so that small population management, those skills are directly applicable to the Scottish wildcat. You know, translocating animals, mixing mm. populations, genetic management, that's all, you know, that's, they're the skills that I've got, that I've acquired, and, and we apply those to, to the Scottish Wildcat. Yeah, I can see how those are, you know, your transferable skills. Um, and again, the option of, you know, talking to people, or the requirement of talking to people and getting people involved seems to come up again. Um, seems like they can be your biggest asset or the, um, you know, a, a big threat to your to your goals yeah the key thing is to get people behind you the people who matter the people who are who are living in these areas who are living with these wildcats and once you get them aside then they become as passionate as you do about it and that that's how you win yeah they're telling everyone to, to neuter their cats what more do you want that's exactly they're helping you yeah, so yeah it's great so what um there are other organizations that are trying to help the scottish wildcats what sets the wildcat haven apart I think we, we, we do what, what I term compassionate conservation. You know, we're not, you know, other organizations, they talk about culling domestic cats, hmm. you know, shooting them. But that disengages communities. That turns people off. Yeah. So we have a very welfare-driven approach. We don't euthanize any cats. We, we neuter domestic cats and we release them where we found them. Um, and I think that's, that's a strong positive to our project. We're also um, anti-captivity, you know, it's a Scottish wildcat. It's not the Scottish zoo cat. Mm. And and I think there is a big, there's another organisation called Scottish Wildcat Action, which is a government-led um, organisation. And they have a licence in place to trap any wildcat in Scotland for a captive breeding programme. Oh, no. And there is a strong agenda to, to bring these animals in from the wild to, for, to set up a captive breeding programme. Now, we are vehemently opposed to that for two main reasons. One is a welfare issue. So these animals sometimes have up to a 10 square mile territory. Now to put the animal, to catch it and put it into a cage for the rest of its life, mm -hmm. uh, there's a serious welfare compromise. I don't think anyone can argue against that. Mm -hmm. um, but also we have to look at the science. I'm a scientist and we have to see, does catching these animals from the wild and putting them into zoos and then releasing the youngsters, does it actually work? Right. And the the evidence, the scientific data suggests it doesn't. So where they tried this with European wildcats in Germany, they found up to an 80% mortality for the released cats in the first year. Now that is simply unacceptable. That's wow. too big. That's too big a risk to take with with this animal. Um, and the final reason really is, once you take a species out of the wild, once you remove it from its ecosystem, then Efforts to conserve those wild places, people become disengaged. They lose interest. And the chance of ever getting that animal back hmm. diminishes. So you need the wildcats in the wild where they belong. And that's, that's our strap line. That's Wildcat Haven's strap line. We save the wildcat in the wild where it belongs. Yeah. And that's what sets us apart from everybody else in this area. Yeah, and that's an interesting component of the... We were talking about how awareness of this species has gotten out that's probably one of the frustrating sides of it is that maybe organizations have started and been spawned after you guys with a little bit of a different agenda they, they say they want to save them but you know in kind of you know weird ways of, of captivating them um, yeah 
So, I, I, yeah, that's that's an interesting side of things. Yeah, when we when we started, you no know, wildcats weren't weren't cool. <laughs> well, wildcats <laughs> were, you know, what people didn't really know about. They didn't really care about them. Now, suddenly, the they're really high up on the conservation agenda in the UK, um, and they... people are people are clambering to be involved in them. But that that's a, that's it's both good because the mm-hmm. more people wanted to save them, but it's only good if they wanted to save them if they have those animals' best interests at heart. If there's other agendas at, um, in play, then it can become damaging and it can actually um, deflect from the real um, from the real agenda to save the wildcats. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I've never thought about that. Of uh, you know, hopefully well-intentioned people, uh, but with completely different ideologies on how how to do certain things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, we're, we're not saying um, there's only we're not saying we know ev- we know everything about wildcats and we're the, the world experts. But what we're saying is we've worked in this animal for for eight years Mm -hmm. we've worked with it in the wild we've studied it in the wild we understand how it can be saved and we have the only template in place to save it in the wild so let's do it yeah and let's not let's not confuse the issue with taking animals from the wild to a zoo yeah because it it can lull people into a false sense of security because if people think there's a captive breeding program then people could relax a little bit but while they're relaxing right no one's neutering domestic cats in the wild. No one's monitoring the wild population. No one's planting new trees. No one's creating new habitat. And yeah, you might have a couple of cats in the zoo, but literally, what's the point? Mm-hmm. What's the point? So, what can people do to help save the Scottish wildcats? There are two really important things that everybody can do to help save the Scottish wildcat. One is awareness raising. Tell everybody you know about the Scottish wildcat. Tell everybody you just found out what the rarest cat on the planet is. Mm. And tell them about our, our website, www.wildcathaven.com. Go on there. Find out information about this animal. Share it with your friends. Go onto our Facebook page. Like it. Share it with your friends. Mm-hmm. And that's how we can build momentum. And if everybody did that, then suddenly it would move up the agenda and we can save this animal. But the second equally important aspect is funding. We receive no government funding and we are only limited by funding. Oh, wow. If we had the required funding, we could save the we could save the wildcat quickly in the next five years. So I ask everybody, if you're interested in, in wildlife, you're interested in conservation, if you're interested in the Scottish wildcat, please go to www.wildcathaven.com and make a donation. It really helps. It allows us to carry out grassroots conservation in the wild where it matters. Amazing, amazing. Um, Paul, I want to thank you for um, the work you're doing, and I will do everything that I can to get the word out to save these beautiful creatures. Um, You know, what you're doing right now, pretty much helping to save an entire species from extinction, I think is incredible. Um, So I want to thank you for your time for coming on, and for your time for, you know, helping save these Scottish wildcats. Thanks so much, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Absolutely. You take care, Paul. Cheers. See you again. Thank you. Thanks for joining. If you liked that episode, feel free to rate, view, and subscribe. That actually really helps. If you haven't seen it yet, take a look at the accompanying blog, Don't Forget Your Boots.com, where you can read more and see photos for all the interviews. Until next time. Take care.